So in chapter 11 here, we're going to talk a little bit about the regulation of gene expression in bacteria. And uh, this kind of goes along previously where we talked about uh, transcription in bacteria. Now we're going to look at how transcription is activated and repressed and kind of regulated. As always, here's the chapter outline for your reference. So in general, the control of transcription is controlled by uh, a large class of proteins, and we call these proteins transcription factors. And the role of these transcription factors are to uh, regulate or kind of put a on-off switch or a throttle on transcription for different genes. And so we can have some transcription factors that increase or decrease uh, the amount of transcription that happens, some things that totally block transcription or completely activate it, and we'll get into these uh, throughout this chapter. So very early on in this genetics revolution, we had um, these pioneers of gene regulation, as they're stated here. So we had Francis Jacob, Jacques Manon, and Henri Louf, who discovered that uh, repressors actually act on genes. So there are these components, these transcription factors uh, called repressors, and they actually block the transcription of genes when a gene needs to be turned off. And so at the time, it was debatable whether or not these uh, transcription factors, these repressors, acted on genes or if they acted on the protein product or if they acted on the mRNA in the transcription pathway where a gene's turned into mRNA and then into protein, maybe these repressors kind of blocked the mRNA from making it to the process of translation. And so in their early work, we found that repressors actually act on genes and not on mRNA or proteins. So there are really two ways that regulatory proteins can control transcription. Uh, the first of which is through activation, and these are activator proteins, as we have uh, indicated over here on the left. And activators bind to a site upstream of the gene's promoter, and they help to promote transcription. And they can do this through recruiting the actual transcription machinery, uh, etc. And then the other form of regulata uh, regulation of proteins is through repression. And so we have these repressor proteins, and what they do is they bind to this specific site uh, called the operator. The operator is in between the promoter and the gene. So remember we have this five prime UTR where this region where it's not turned into uh, actual amino acids or polypeptides through the translation sequence. Um, so we had that uh, minus 35, minus 10 sequence in bacteria. Um, or the TATA box in uh, eukaryotes. Um, also in this region, in this 5' UTR, are operators. Now this is a consensus sequence that are specific to certain repressors. So these repressor proteins will specifically search for these sequences and bind there. And what they do is they act as a roadblock, right? And so if you can imagine, we have our egg uh, uh, RNA uh, transcription RNA polymerase here. Um, and if it was to try to go and transcribe this gene, we have this big old Hulk and repressor protein in the way, and it's not gonna allow that RNA polymerase to proceed up the gene and proceed with transcription. Now, if that repressor is removed, then this RNA polymerase is able to access the gene. So that's how the, polymer, or the uh, repressor works and the activator is kind of the opposite. So normally, if there is no activator bound upstream of uh, where this polymerase is here, then because there's no activator here, this polymerase is not being able to be recruited to that promoter site. Now, in cases where the activator is present, it can help to bring that RNA polymerase and bind it to the promoter and then allow for transcription to happen. So let's talk about this differential transcription, right? So genes are turned on and off in different circumstances depending on their environment. So whether or not you, for instance, need to activate a heat response gene because your cells are being overheated, well, something's got to sense the fact that the temperature is rising, 
and then genes that respond to increased heat can be activated, turned into proteins, and then actually have some sort of physiological response within the cell. So these regulatory proteins, whether they're activators or repressors, generally have some way of sensing an environment or sensing something in the environment which will help them to act. Thus, these activator and repressor proteins generally exist in two states. They have a no, a no effector state and an effector state. So effectors are things in the environment that uh, the proteins, whether it be an activator or a repressor, sense to change their conformation. And so with, uh, within these proteins, we have what is called an allosteric site. So on this activator on the top here, the top shows an allosteric site. And this allosteric site is where some sort of environmental stimulus or molecule will bind and change its orientation. So unbound, this um, activator here kind of looks like a kidney bean, right? So we have this rough kidney bean shape here. And then if there is an effector present, it turns instead to kind of this shape of an, an eight on the side or an infinity sign, right? And so the same thing happens with repressors. So a rep in this case, the repressor unbound, so no effector, no environmental stimuli to uh, change the orientation of this, its natural state is that figure eight shape. And then when an effector is present, some sort of environmental stimuli, we change its conformation to that kidney bean shape. Now, with activators, going back to activators, its unbound state where there's no effector means it's just kind of floating around in the nucleus or uh, in the cytoplasm of, of prokaryotes just kind of hanging out, right? And when an effector is present, it gets turned on and then it actually binds to the DNA, recruits that transcription machinery and allows that gene to be turned up, right? Now, repressors are opposite. So when there are no effectors present, the steady state, then this repressor is bound to the DNA and it's preventing any transcription. Remember, it binds at the operator and acts as that roadblock. Well, then when an effector is present, when it starts to sense its environment, that something's changed, then the effector binds to that allosteric site and causes a confirmation change, which then causes this removal of the repressor from that operator and then allows transcription to proceed. That roadblock is then removed. So we're gonna look at rep uh, repressor proteins with this classical example of the LAC operon, which is a very uh, easy to understand repressor concept in, that we use for an example. So in this example, we have the LAC operon, which com uh, consists of this promoter, an operator, and then three genes, LAC-Z, LAC-Y, and LAC-A, that are all under the same promoter and operator. So these are, whenever the gene is transcribed, all three of those genes get transcribed together, right? And so LAC-Z, this first gene, uh, is responsible for cleaving um, lactose into glucose and galactose. It's called the beta-galactosidase. This second gene, LAC-Y, is a permease. And so the role of this gene is to help take more lactose into the cell. Uh, it makes that membrane more permeable, hence the name permease, and allows it to continue to take lactose in. And then this A gene is actually not required for lactose metabolism, but it just falls under the same uh, operon. And so upstream of that gene, up in a different location, not under that same promoter and operator, is this repressor protein, I. So this lac I gene is responsible for helping to regulate that. And it makes sense that that repressor would not be under the same uh, promoter and operator because it has to be continuously around and transcribed to make sure this transcription here is regulated. And so it can't be tied to that same transcription. And so inducers then play a role on whether or not this repressor is active or not active. 
So let's look at this regulation a little further, starting with a situation where there's no lactose present. So as you can see here, we have the repressor gene uh, way upstream, and then we have our promoter, operator, and then LAC, Z, Y, and A, all under that same promoter and operator. Now I just want to make a note that a promoter, the regulatory regions such as the operator, and then all the genes under that same regulation or that same promoter, we refer to that as an operon. Now I want you to make sure that you keep clear that an operon, which is this collection of genes and regulatory regions under one promoter, now that is different than an operator. An operator is where the repressor protein will bind to. Now in this example where no lactose is present, we have our repressor gene I that is not under the regulation of our uh, promoter or operon or operator. See, I'm already getting them mixed up. Operator. Um, and it gets transcribed into mRNA. And that mRNA is then translated by the ribosome into a polypeptide chain. This polypeptide chain is then folded into an active protein. And if no lactose is present, then this protein will go to the lac operon and it will bind to that operator and it will prevent the transcription occurring of lax Z, Y, and A. And this makes sense biologically, right? If you're an organism and you're floating around and you have genes that are there to turn lactose into fuel, if there's no lactose present, you'd just be wasting your energy and your time to actually make that product, right? Because what's the point of having beta-galactosidase and that permease for this lactose metabolism if there's no lactose around? So instead, there's this nice regulatory element that says, okay, this protein, this uh, repressor here, it'll kind of check the environment. And it sees that there's no lactose around, so we're gonna completely turn off this lac operon because we don't need it at the time. Now let's look at a case where lactose is present. So if lactose is present, the same thing happens with that repressor protein. It's kind of constitutively, uh, constitutively expressed, meaning it's always expressed. And so we have this mRNA that's made. Again, it gets folded or it gets translated into polypeptides, which then get folded into this repressor protein. And now this repressor protein is heading over to that lac operon. It's floating around and it's looking for its operator to bind to. And so it's headed to the lac operon and it's gonna go bind to that operator and repress RNA polymerase. But along the way, this effector, this lactose, which is the effector for this in this case, is floating around and it all of a sudden binds to that repressor. And so it binds, remember, to that allosteric site. And so it changes the conformation from this peanut shape, their kidney bean, or peanut shape, we'll say, uh, and it turns it into a kidney bean shape. So when that happens, it doesn't allow this repressor to bind to the operator anymore. So it's changed how it, its conformation and it's made it into a, um, a non-binding shape because that lactose is present. And then that RNA polymerase will continue and transcribe this gene and start to make lac Z and lac Y to break down uh, lactose. And so if you look at this from a functional perspective, if the, the role of this repressor protein is to stop the synthesis of lactose processing genes or lactose processing genes and turning them into proteins, then we don't want that to, to be effective if there's lactose around because we need to break that down and start turning that into uh, to fuel for the cell. So this repressor protein will sense if there's lactose around. And if there is, it says, okay, I'm not going to block the synthesis of those lactose proteins because we need them to make this into fuel. So here we have a much better picture. I uh, kind of uh, you know, jumped the shark, so to speak, and, and finished talking about it. But we, we have, they have added a picture of the synthesis of this operon into mRNA. And as we can see, they also show here that 
Um, this mRNA then is actually translated into beta-galactosidase, which is was important for breaking lactose into galactose and glucose. Uh, permease, which means that it can take up more lactose, and then that third gene, which is not important for the uh, in regards to the lac opera or lactose metabolism, I should say. So an important concept with these uh, molecular happenings within the cell is the concept of cis-acting and transacting. Now, cis-acting is means acting on the same, right? Um, and trans being opposite. Uh, and so we'll start with cis-acting. So when we talk about these regulatory elements, we talk about repressors and activators, operators, promoters, et cetera, all of these concepts within this uh, repression and controlling transcription. So we'll start with operators. So operators are cis-acting. What that means is an operator, remember, is the sequence here that is um, binding those repressors, right? And so an operator can only participate in the repression of genes on the exact same chromosome. So if we're looking at a diploid organism like humans or Drosophila or Arabidopsis or a myriad of other ones, we have two chromosomes, right? So you have uh, one from your mom and one that you've inherited from your dad. So the role of this operator on your mom's chromosome, this operator can only act in the process of repressing genes on the same chromosome as it's attached to. And that makes sense, right? Because we know that repressors bind to it and prevent transcription. So this operator, it cannot in any way affect whether or not genes are transcribed on your dad's chromosomes because it's not really going out and doing anything. It's just acting as a site for where that repressor will bind to. So now let's look at this in terms of repressors. So we said that operators are cis-acting, meaning they can only play a role in the repression of genes on the exact same physical chromosome as them. Well, repressors are transacting. This means that a repressor can act on either chromosome regardless. So in this case here, we have two copies of that I repressor gene. In this top one, we'll say that, again, the top one is your mom's chromosome and the, the bottom one is the one you inherited from your dad. In this case, a mutation in the gene from your mom's chromosome, the I gene from your mom's chromosome, does not mean that this lack operon over here goes unchecked because since repressors are just proteins that are floating around uh, in the nucleus or in the cytoplasm of eukaryotes, or uh, sorry, of prokaryotes, um, since these are just floating around, this repressor from your dad's chromosome that is active is free to act on your mom's chromosome or on your dad's chromosome because it's not bound uh, physically to either chromosome. It's floating around and then kind of, it can float to your mom's, it can float to your dad's, it can float to either. Now, if we look at repressors again, this thing is stuck, right? It's stuck on your mom's chromosome. And so if this had a mutation in it here, there's no way that the operator from your other chromosome down here on your dad's side, there's no way that it can go and help out on your mom's chromosome because they're physically linked. So repressors being transacting means that a repressor from one chromosome, when it turns into a protein, can then go act on either chromosome. So sometimes mutations can play a role in repression, especially uh, this transacting repressors. And so in this example here, we have two versions of this repressor gene. We have IS and then we have I plus. And so I plus is our wild type, just normal repressor. It senses lactose. And if it senses lactose, uh, it will not bind to the operator and allow the genes to be transcribed. However, IS is a mutant. And so IS has a mutation in that allosteric site. So those environmental factors like lactose that it's looking for, it can't 
bind those. It doesn't bind correctly anymore. And they kind of denoted this here in these pictures by changing the shape here. So you see on this uh, repressor enzyme here, uh, we have a triangle shaped allosteric site. And then on the actual lactose, we have a square site. And so even though lactose is present, because there's been a mutation in this repressor, at least in the allosteric site of this repressor, it's gonna go and bind and prevent the actual transcription of lactose regardless of if there's any present in, or, or not, or I should say the transcription of the, the lac genes. So even when lactose is around, those genes aren't turned on because we have a mutation. And since this is transacting, we get a problem where because this enzyme is free to float wherever, this uh, mutated um, repressor can also go to the other copy of this uh, LAC operon and block both of them. So we have these big honking repressors that are stopping transcription of both of these um, two LAC operons, even though we do have one copy of this repressor that is working the way it should, the fact that they're transacting means the mutation of one of them will cause both of those lac operons to be not functional because those repressors are not gonna come off unless that allosteric site is activated and because they're mutated, then they're not ever gonna be activated. The lactose isn't gonna do it. So this mutation will cause repression of both of those lac operons, even though we do have lactose there. So uh, just a reminder from our transcription in prokaryotes uh, section, upstream. Um, so we have our transcription start site upstream of that. Uh, we have this five prime UTR, and that is this minus 10 region and this minus 35 region in prokaryotes. Both of these regions, remember, are kind of conserved sequences. And this is uh, the promoter region where the actual transcription machinery knows to go and contact and kind of lay down on the railroad tracks to start transcribing the genes. So these are highly conserved regions um, where changes, significant changes to those uh, nucleotides in those regions will cause them to uh, no longer be able to attract that uh, RNA polymerase. So for a lot of genes, for most genes that is, there are a lot of uh, regulators for its transcription. And so we talked about uh, the lac operon and how a repressor turns on and off based on if lactose is present. However, we want to be much more fine-tuned if we're a gene like uh, the lac operon as to whether or not it should be transcribed or not. And so, for instance, if there are high levels of glucose, most bacteria like to uh, metabolize glucose first because uh, glucose is the most easily uh, metabolized or energy efficient of the sugars. And so if we have a lot of glucose, there's no point in us making these lac genes because we might as well just eat the glucose first and just uh, ignore that lactose, right? And so, uh, there are positive controls based on glucose, whether or not we should transcribe those lac genes. And so one of the ways this works is that if there are high levels of glucose, we also have low levels of cyclic AMP. And if we have uh, high levels of cyclic AMP, we have low levels of glucose. They're kind of inversely correlated with one another. And so this cyclic AMP becomes kind of a marker molecule to, to show this regulatory pathway, how much glucose is around. And so when uh, cyclic AMP is high, then it will bind to this protein called cap protein. And if it binds to cap protein, we know that that means, remember it's inversely correlated. So if it's binding to cap protein, that means there's a lot of it, and it means that there must be low glucose. And so once CAP is bound to cyclic AMP, it will go and it will go to the promoter and that CAP protein acts as that activator that we talked about in our earlier example. And that activator will help to bring in this RNA polymerase transcription machinery and allow it to transcribe these LAC genes. This makes sense because if we have this 
cap protein activated because of cyclic, cyclic AMP, that means that we have low glucose and we have to start looking for energy production in other areas as opposed to our preferred method of glucose. So we can start to make these LAC uh, genes to metabolize lactose because we need to make up for this lack of glucose that we have. So let's look at how these negative and positive controls kind of work in concert to help fine tune the expression of this lac operon. So our first example here is that we have glucose present and we have no lactose present. So if glucose is present, then remember there's no cyclic AMP that is created. And because of that, we don't need that positive control to activate the lac operon, because we have plenty of glucose. Why do we need to work on lactose if we've got all we can eat in glucose? So we don't activate, this is no need to activate this lac operon. And from the negative aspect, we're always making this repressor protein and it's sensing the environment. And it's not sensing any lactose around, because remember in our condition up here, we said that there's no lactose present. So since it senses no lactose, it's gonna come in and it's gonna to bind to this operator right here, and it's gonna prevent transcription anyway. So not only are we not actively bringing that RNA polymerase in for transcription, but we're blocking it if it ever did come in by accident. So this is completely shut off, zero transcription is occurring here. Our second example here is that we have glucose present and lactose present. So we have our preferred sugar, which is lacto or is uh, glucose, and then we have lactose, which is kind of our backup sugar, right? And so if lactose is present, then we get, uh, or sorry, if glucose is present, remember no cyclic AMP is, is bound then because we don't need to activate uh, the lac operon. And so because it's present, uh, this cap protein doesn't bind, we'll keep working on using that glucose. And so now if we look at the repressor and lactose is present, we see that the repressor, remember, is always made and it is bound at that allosteric site by lactose, so it's not able to bind to the operon. So even though we're not actively recruiting that RNA polymerase to make these lac genes, we'll still get some expression of this gene. So while we don't have zero, as we had in example A, we get a very little bit of lac uh, mRNA. And generally, uh, this is okay because if we have a lot of lactose present, we can't just keep accumulating lactose. So instead of using it as a way of our primary energy production, it's kind of breaking it down slowly to make sure not too much of it gets there, right? And then lastly, we have our example here where we have no glucose, so not our favorite sugar, it's all gone, and we have lactose. So remember in conditions of low glu glucose, we have a lot of cyclic AMP of CAP, and so CAP will then go, or of CAMP, sorry, cyclic AMP, and cyclic AMP will go bind to CAP, and CAP then will actively bring in that transcription machinery to the promoter because it's an activator, and then if we look at the repressor, we have our repressor protein that's always constitutively expressed, means it's always around, and it senses the lactose in the environment and it sees lactose is there. And because of that, it's not gonna repress either. So not only are we not repressing, but we're actively turning on the gene. And what that means is we have an abundant amount of lac mRNA made, so we can break down that lactose, especially because we need it now that there's no glucose around. So just to hammer this home, let's look at repression and activation one more time. So in repression, we have a repressor that is constitutively expressed, meaning it's always around, and it, its normal standing state, it will go and bind and prevent transcription. Now, if there was an inducer around, that repressor will sense that inducer. It'll bind to the allosteric site, which is this little spot right here, and it will prevent this repressor from binding to the operon. When that happens, and this repressor has been stimulated by that inducer, 
we do get translation or transcription, excuse me, of that gene, which will lead to translation uh, of a protein. Now let's compare this to activation. So in activation, we have an active factor, an activator that is floating around. It's constitutively expressed as well. And in the presence of an inducer, that activator will actively bring transcription machinery to that promoter and lead to an increase in expression. If there is no inducer around, that activator is not stimulated and it will not actively bring anything to stimulate this trans, uh, transcription. And so if you were to compare these and induce or a, a repressor up at the top here that is induced, it removes a roadblock and allows transcription. An activator that is induced actively tries to increase transcription. So inducing both of these lead to increased transcription, but one is by removing all the blocks and the other is by increasing uh, and turning on and increasing and bringing that transcription machinery to make uh, transcription happen more. So we're going to talk about one more operon, uh, also in the sugar metabolism vein. Uh, this is the ARA operon or the ravenose operon. And this operon has uh, these control genes. It has three control sites and then uh, these three structural genes, uh, B, A, and D. Now what's cool about this operon is that a single protein can act as either an activator or a repressor within this operon. So in situations where cyclic AMP is high, remember cyclic AMP was inversely correlated with glucose. So if there's high cyclic AMP, that means there's low glucose and we need to start metabolizing other sugars. So in this case, we see that this uh, uh, cyclic AMP cap complex will bind to this ARA1 region of, of the operon. And additionally, if we do have arabinose, this sugar that we are looking to metabolize, then this ARAC protein will recognize and bind the arabinose, which is this kind of dark blue square that I'm trying to color in here. And it will act as an activator and help to bring in the transcription machinery to this location to transcribe this arabinose operon. Now, if there are no arabinose around, this ARAC protein will bind still to the same location, but it will also bind to this ARAO, this ARA operator upstream of the ARA1. And at this location here, this ARAO, you can see that it folds over. And by doing this, it prevents the binding of this cap and cyclic AMP complex in here. It doesn't fit in here because it's kind of pinched off and it really prevents the transcription machinery from getting in here as well. And so the same ARAC protein, if there's arabinose present, will help to recruit transcription machinery. But if there's no arabinose present, it's like, why do we even need to make these BAD arabinose genes? We're just gonna turn it all off. So it clamps down and kind of folds over that section of the uh, genome and says, we don't need these because there's no arabinose anyways. So this same protein ARAC acts as an activator and a repressor in this case. So lastly, we're going to talk a little bit about the regulation of DNA and uh, bacteriophages and those viruses that we talked about earlier. So uh, bacteriophage DNA has kind of two states. It's either lytic, which means that the cells are going to lyse, or it's lysogenic, which means it's inserted into the host's genome and it kind of lies dormant there. And so you've heard of some viral diseases uh, that lie dormant, like herpes and, and things like that. Um, so we'll, we're going to talk about lytic versus lysogenic uh, bacteriophage DNA. So uh, the stage 
or the type of stage that this DNA is in, lytic or lysogenic, depends on the amount of resources available. So here we have a lambda phage, and it's got some lambda DNA in the head of it, and it's going to infect this bacteria cell by in injecting its DNA into the bacteria. Now in the lytic cycle, we see that the DNA is replicated outside of the chromosome, and we get a lot of copies of this uh, viral DNA. And this viral DNA, uh, it kind of hijacks the machinery of this bacteria, and it starts to uh, not only make copies or transcribe those genes that were in that viral DNA, but then it hijacks the proteome and it starts to assemble these viral heads and the neck and the collar and all those parts of the, viral, uh, the virus that we had seen earlier. And just like our normal case, uh, it will package the DNA into those viral heads. Eventually it'll get to a breaking point where the cell lyses and that DNA or that those viruses are then let out into the environment to go and infect further and more bacteria. So now if we look at the lysogenic cycle, the same thing happens where the virus will inject its DNA into the host bacteria. And the, in the lysogenic versus the lytic cycle, the DNA is instead integrated into the host chromosome through recombination. And so here we have what's called a lambda prophage, and that is this piece of viral DNA that was integrated into the host chromosome. And it will continue to be replicated whenever the cell gets replicated, the bacteria gets replicated. And that DNA will lie dormant in that host's chromosome until there becomes an abundance of resources. When resources are kind of limiting, there's the prophage DNA doesn't want to come out and try to start making viral heads because there might not be enough you know, of the basic components around to make those, uh, replicate those virus. So once these uh, resources start to become much more abundant, that prophage uh, will start to replicate, it'll excise itself from the host chromosome and be replicated and lead to this lysis cycle that we saw previously on the left-hand side here. So what's cool is if we look at the lambda phage, uh, this, this DNA or this uh, genome of that virus, we have kind of two life cycles, the lysis and the lysogenic stage segregated appropriately. And so if we look to the right here, we have this uh, replication proteins section, which helps the replication of uh, this, the lambda DNA. We have the lysis genes, these genes are responsible for when there's enough of this product made, helping the phage bust out of the host cell. <clears throat> we have the head and tail genes. So these are the genes responsible for being transcribed and translated to make those products that are needed for packaging. So like the head, the tail and stuff that, that make more viruses. And then on the other side, we have the lysogenic genes. So we have these recombination genes. These genes are there to help get the actual phage DNA into the host chromosome. And then we also have these excision and integrase genes. So these genes make proteins that help to uh, integrate into the host chromosome and also then remove from the host chromosome when it's time to go into that lysis uh, life cycle. Okay, now once we the DNA from this virus uh, has kind of made the decision of lytic versus lysogenic growth, and we're not going to go terribly into the weeds under this because this could be a whole discussion of uh, this, this system of lysogeny and uh, lytic cycles, and uh, honestly, there are more qualified people to talk about it than me. Uh, so we're just gonna kind of uh, give a, a thousand yard view of this process. So once this has uh, been decided, this uh, lysogeny uh, versus this lytic cycle, uh, there are kind of two ways of repression that, that occur here. So in the lysogeny stage, which we're, if we remember our last side is falls to the left where there are the, grow, or the integrase 
um, and their combination genes and things to kind of lay dormant in this cell, uh, this RNA polymerase will bind uh, at this C1 region and it will transcribe genes that lead to the production of this lambda repressor. And the production of this lambda repressor will lead to the repressor binding at these OR1, OR2, and OR3 repressor sites. And as these accumulate, not only will they stop the production of crow initially, so we'll continue on this lysogenic cycle. So when they bind to the OR1 and, and beginning of OR2, they stop crow production. But eventually, this is kind of like an off switch. So it's a feedback, a positive feedback loop where when you've produced a whole bunch of this lambda repressor, it eventually will stop the production of itself and the rest of those lysogeny genes. Now, in the lytic cycle, it functions the same way as a pod positive feedback control. So when it's been decided that this cell needs to go through the lytic stage, um, we have the transcription of genes towards the right here, and this leads to the tran er, transcription and uh, formation of the protein product crow. Crow forms a dimer, so two of them come together, and these bind starting at the OR3 site as a repressor of the lytic cycle. And similar to uh, the lysogeny cycle, as we continue to make more and more crow, because we've stopped this whole lytic side, they will continue to bind, and then they'll bind to OR2 as a dimer. And when more and more gets made, they'll get bind to OR1 as a dimer, and then completely repress this entire lytic side as well, because at that point, enough product has been made for lysis of the cell and the cell is going to die. 